Welcome to Blessed Unrest, our 13th conference since we began giving conferences in 2014. One good thing about this being our first virtual conference is that I don't have to tell you where the bathrooms are. But I do want to tell you who our sponsors are, so we will be having a slideshow every now and then with their logos, and we are most grateful for their support. We'll have lunch breaks at around 12.15 and then come back at 12.30 since you can probably eat while you're watching. We are using a new technology, relatively speaking, Zoom, and so far it's worked pretty well and we hope it continues to do so even though it might be creaking a bit under the stress of all the new Zoomers everywhere in the world. So here we are in a new coronavirus world, but is it new really? The underlying causes of this startling pandemic and our even more startling devolving climate crisis are mostly the same and have been developing over the thousands of years of civilizations. That is wanton destruction of the biosphere and the life support systems that make existence possible for so many creatures, including us homo sapiens. We all have our favorite others to blame here, the bad people with the wrong political, economic, e ethnic, religious, epidemiological, or even sports team preferences. We are never going to resolve all our differences, nor do we have to, but somehow we must collectively recognize that without healthy and biodiverse ecosystems, we of the human species and millions of other species are rushing into ecological hell and threatened oblivion, if not extinction. That's the bad news. The good news, and remarkably good news it is, is that there are millions of people around the world pulling in another direction. A direction that recognizes that nature not only bats last, but bats first and bats always. We need to be on nature's team, the only team. Civilizations grow up with hubris, indigenous peoples better understand the rules, and the rest of us will do well to catch up. Blessed Unrest takes us to the new abundant world. And as Paul Hawken told us in his 2007 book, it's the largest movement on the planet that no one has ever heard of. Paul sends his regrets that he can't join us, but will show his six minute video sometime during the conference and you can watch it from a link on our conference homepage. Yes, we are bombarded with bad news, but this most helpful yet still invisible movement is a beacon for us all. It's now 13 years after Blessed Unrest was published. The movement has grown in extraordinary ways and you will hear from a roster of speakers who have done remarkably blessedly unrestful and hopeful things. Most of them you've probably never heard of and that's intentional on our part because Blessed Unrest is about you and me and all of us. We all have an inspiring and productive role to play. And we at Bio for Climate feel that we all have opportunities to regenerate dying ecosystems, cool the biosphere, tame the weather, reverse floods and droughts, restore biodiversity, bring back abundant food and water, avert pandemics, and successfully address the worst pandemic of all, global warming. Speaking of which, I'd like to briefly discuss an aspect of global warming that is all too often ignored. That is, it's not all about carbon dioxide. While CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and of course we want the excess levels to go down to a more comfortable pre-industrial level, it is only a single factor, an isolated variable in an extremely complex planetary system. We know that a system is far greater than the sum of its parts, far greater than any of its parts. Yet here we are having obsessed with only one of its parts for over the last 30 years. And where has that gotten us? Just more and more climate chaos because we've been asking the wrong questions. So I have a suggestion, stop talking about carbon dioxide. Of course, I understand that excess greenhouse gases trap too much heat in the earth's atmosphere, oceans and land, but there's something else going on here. Despite the disruption wrought by increasing planetary heat, roughly two degrees Fahrenheit above the 20th century average, 
Blessed unresters around the world have taken bare, baked, devastated lands and turned them green again, brought temperatures down, tempered floods and droughts, restored biodiversity, grown abundant food while building soil health. We've done all of these things even with elevated planetary temperatures, even with way too high greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, even with devastated forests and coastlines. How is that possible? And why don't we talk about it? There is no question about the importance of eliminating, eliminating fossil fuel emissions and other greenhouse gas generators for many reasons as well as climate. But by now it should be crystal clear we're not getting there by focusing on carbon dioxide numbers. Here's what happens. A regenerative farmer or rancher or permaculturist takes land that's a mess, exhausted, parched, barely growing weeds, devoid of important soil life, and turns it into a biodiverse paradise, resplendent with abundant food, cool even on hot days, a place we'd love to live in when we can find it, when we can co-create it with nature. Then a conventional climate activist or si client, then a conventional climate activist or scientist comes along and says, that's fine, but how much carbon does it capture per acre per year? But what if the results are what we want, what we're aching to see? Does it matter exactly how much carbon is captured? If it's green, that's CO2 no longer in the atmosphere. Some of it cycles up again, some of it cycles down into the soils. A prosperous living biosphere is the goal, not some carbon dioxide numbers, which, by the way, people are arguing about endlessly. Let's just get to work. We know a great deal about what to do and how to do it. I don't object to argument and discussion, but I do object when we become so concerned about what the numbers are that they become an obstacle to well-founded action. David Johnson, a scientist at New Mexico State University who spoke at our 2017 conference, discovered that soils too low in fungi are far less productive than soils balanced in their fungal bacterial ratios. One of the culprits in this is tilling and compost turning, which breaks fungal networks and prevents them from doing their job. When David carefully preserved the fungi in his test plots, he found that productivity increased dramatically, as did soil carbon. Naturally, a typical conventional acre of farmland sequesters one ton of carbon per year or less. Johnson's acres captured 10 tons per year, and that number is growing as he improves his techniques. And anyone can do it. He's got videos online that show you how. Okay, I confess, I just spoke a carbon number, but it's to make a point. You can see and feel the difference in the land. The carbon number is one result. The important part is the abundant growth, plant health, biodiversity. I'm not against analytical science. It has its place, but we can't let it obstruct, obstruct practical success because in a materialist culture, we imagine that the abstraction of numbers alone represents the realities of a living planet. The earth is far too complex to be reduced to numbers. Collective wisdom, essence of blessed unrest is what matters in the long and the short run. I welcome you here and enthusiastically thank you for joining us. I trust our courageous and creative speakers will enlighten and entertain, inspire you as we move forward to face our daunting but solvable challenges, and bring you excitement and hope for a world already being reborn. Thank you. <laughs>